Welcome to the LSE for this online uh, event. My name is Edgar Whitley and I'm an Associate Professor of Information Systems at the LSE. I'm very pleased to be here to welcome Professor Sinan Aral back to the LSE today. Sinan is the David Austin Professor of Management, Marketing, IT and Data Science at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, Director of the MIT Initiative on the Digital Economy and Head of MIT's Social Analytics Lab. He is also an alumnus of LSE and I've known him since he studied for his MSc in Information Systems at LSE, shall we say a few years ago. I was also his MSc dissertation advisor and came to get to know him really, really well during his time. I was also lucky enough to write one of the reference letters in support of his PhD application at MIT, where I predicted he would excel as a future academic. And that prediction fortunately has come true as you will hear in today's uh, talk. Since then, we've kept in touch, uh, regularly meeting at various academic conferences. And it seemed that every time we bumped into each other, one of the things I was doing was congratulating him on the best paper prize that he'd won that year, or the best dissertation prize uh, that he, 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 he was awarded. Most recently, we met up in person shortly after being promoted to full professor at MIT. And we spent a fun few hours talking about our research interests and also joining his son in a game of football in the office. Although if MIT people are listening, we weren't actually playing football in the office. In today's event, Sinan will draw on two decades of his own research and business experience and go under the hood of the biggest, most powerful social networks to tackle the critical question of just how much social media affects and shapes our choices for better or for worse. For those Twitter users in the audience, the hashtag for today's events is hashtag LSE hype machine. This online event is being recorded and will hopefully be made available as a podcast subject to no technical uh, difficulties. As usual, there will be a chance for you to put your questions to Sinan. To submit your questions, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screens. Those questions will then be forwarded to me and I'll then put them uh, to Sinan. Please do let us know your name and affiliation, and we're particularly keen to hear from our students, our alumni and incoming students, so please let us know that as part of your question. There is also a book related to this event, Sinan's book, The Hype Machine, and more information about the book can be found on the event listing. But we're here to hear Sinan, not to hear me talk about him, so I'm delighted to hand over to Sinan. Well. Thank you so much, Edgar. It's great to see you, even if only virtually. Uh, it's a huge honor to be here. Thank you so much for the invitation. Um, as you correctly note, my academic career uh, began at LSE, so it's a special privilege to be here today with all of you. It's fantastic uh, to see interest uh, in this topic, which obviously uh, is ripped from the headlines. You cannot uh, turn on your television or listen to the radio or a podcast or read the newspaper without seeing the tremendous impact that social media is having on our economies, our uh, democracies and our public health every single day. Uh, and so what I'd like to do is just to take you on a whirlwind tour of the book uh, very quickly. I wanna keep my remarks short so that we can focus on the conversation and uh, and all of your questions. So I'm gonna share my screen, give you a little bit of a tour of the book uh, and then, and then uh, turn it back over uh, for a conversation to uh, Edgar. Somebody give me an indication that, that you can see that. Oops. Is that good? Okay, excellent. So yes, uh, for 20 years, I've been studying social media. Um, I began four years before Mark Zuckerberg invented Facebook, uh, and I've been studying it ever since. And uh, I am dismayed and disappointed to say that in the book, I predicted a lot of the things that have happened in just the last few months. And in fact, uh, over the course of this last year, um, and the three main predictions of the book, the disruptions to our democracies, our economies and our public health uh, have all come true and are continuing to come true. And I'm a big fan of books like Surveillance Capitalism by Shoshana Zuboff and Zucked by Roger McNamee. And in fact, movies like The Social Dilemma on Netflix or The Great Hack that came before it. 
But this book is really designed to take off where those books and movies leave off, which is to ask, what can we do? What can we concretely do to fix the social media crisis that we find ourselves in? So let me give you a little bit of a whirlwind tour and then we'll have a conversation. So uh, I made a number of predictions in the book. Um, and the, the first one that, that really uh, sort of hit me hard uh, was about the Capitol riot. And the book, which was finished in the summer of 2020, a full six to eight months before January 2021 and the Capitol riot, uh, I write this in the book. While some claim that fake news is benign, during protests and confusion, it's a real threat, not only to the election, but to the sanctity and peace of the election process. If the election were to be contested, fake news could escalate the contest perhaps the violence. And I followed that up uh, in October when I wrote <clears throat> several factors are combining to create the kindling that could catalyze a blaze of violence across the country. I'm talking about the United States here. The spark that ignites that blaze could very well come from social media in the form of fake news, coordinated conspiracies plotted over Facebook and Twitter. And as we saw on January 6th, that's exactly what happened. And our, the disruptions to our democracies were foreseeable and were being uh, predicted by experts well in advance. So I don't consider myself an oracle uh, by pointing to research that we've been doing for decades about the role that social media has in influencing our behaviors, our norms and our perceptions and actually changing the way we think and act in the offline world. But it's not just about our democracies. Uh, it's also about our economies. In the book, I write about the hack crash of 2013, where in April of 2013, the AP uh, Twitter handle put out this tweet that said, breaking, two explosions in the White House and Barack Obama has been injured. And this tweet was retweeted 4,000 times in five minutes and it went viral thereafter. But it wasn't real news put out by the AP, it was fake news that was propagated by Syrian hackers that had infiltrated the AP Twitter handle. And the thing about social media is that it doesn't exist in a vacuum. It's tied to systems, automated trading algorithms and sensing algorithms that are understanding the sentiment uh, being expressed in social media and then uh, trading on that sentiment. And so what happened when this tweet went viral is that it create, it triggered these algorithms to trade on the sentiment that Barack Obama had been injured or killed in an explosion in the White House and the uncertainty that that would create. And it sent the stock market crashing, wiping out nearly $140 billion in equity value in a, in a matter of minutes. And that's just from one tweet. Imagine all of the hundreds of millions of tweets to trillions of tweets that happen every day, every week that affect the fortunes of small and medium-sized businesses and large corporations alike, including in the stock market, but also in terms of their reputation and so on. And it's not just about our democracies and our economies. Uh, you know, a, a, a replay of this exact type of event uh, happened with the crowd mobilization around the GameStop stock price rise in January of this year. And I wrote an op-ed in the Washington Post that reiterated that the GameStop example just signals the new destabilizing collision between social media online crowds and the markets that we see happening uh, every single day. But it's not just about our democracies and our economies, it's also about our public health. At the MIT Initiative on the Digital Economy, which I direct, we have been studying and tracking COVID-19 misinformation, and most recently, its relationship to vaccine hesitancy. We are running the largest longitudinal survey, global survey of COVID-19 behaviors, norms, and perceptions uh, worldwide in collaboration with Facebook and the World Health Organization. We have surveyed over 1.7 million people around the world uh, in over 65 countries since July. And we're tracking uh, their belief in COVID uh, misinformation, the effects that that might have on vaccine hesitancy. And we're running very large experiments to understand how we can counteract this type of misinformation. But 
This misinformation around COVID-19 was also foreseeable because before COVID-19, it was measles that was the subject of anti-vaccine misinformation, uh, especially in the United States. So for instance, uh, the United States eradicated measles in the year 2000. In 2010, there were only 63 cases of measles in the US during the entire year. In 2019, there were 1,250 cases in just the first six months of the year. And the entire year saw an 1,800% increase in measles cases. And when you look at where these outbreaks happened, it was in tight knit communities like Rockland County, New York and Clark County, Washington. And when you compare this to the Facebook ad buys of anti-vaccine content, you see that the targeting of those ad buys is targeted exactly at these types of tight knit communities. So social media can dramatically disrupt our democracies, our economies and our public health. And this is all a consequence of what I call the hype machine, the social media industrial complex from Facebook to Twitter, to Snapchat, to WeChat, to Instagram, to um, all of the different ecosystem players that support these, uh, these platforms. Another thing that you might be uh, surprised to know is that when we think about the effect that these technologies have on the decisions and behaviors that we take every day, you might be surprised to know that romantic matches created by algorithms over social dating sites like Tinder or Hinge or Bumble surpassed matches created by traditional introductions and face-to-face -face meetings in 2013. So the question becomes, how is this affecting the genetic pool and the diversity of human evolution going forward? the effects that this kind of technology and the algorithms that underlie it have on our society can no longer be overstated. But social media isn't just bad news. It also has tremendous promise for delivering uh, amazing amounts of societal value. So when Nepal had the greatest earthquake it's experienced in 100 years, Europe donated $3 million to relief efforts, the US donated 10 million, and Facebook spun up a donate now button and raised 15.5 million more than Europe and the US combined from 770,000 individual donors from 175 countries. That demonstrates how uh, much mobilization can be had for good using uh, this kind of technology. People like to make fun of the ice bucket challenge, but it's difficult to laugh at a quarter of a billion dollars raised for ALS research in just eight weeks, a tremendous amount of positive value can be had uh, with the promise of social media. And the, the rise of social movements like the Black Lives Matter movement and the Arab Spring before that and the snow revolution in Russia and protest movements in Hong Kong and Ukraine the Black Lives Matter movement founders say, for example, that there would be no Black Lives Matter movement in the United States without social media. In the book, I describe both the power and the fragility of movements that are catalyzed and sustained uh, by social media. In addition, research that we've done at MIT and that's been done at Stanford uh, quantifies the tremendous amount of economic opportunity that's created by these platforms. So it's been estimated by our research at MIT and at Stanford that Facebook creates $370 billion in consumer surplus in the US alone every year. And that's just in the US. Imagine that worldwide. Most of, the Facebook, of Facebook's users are outside of the United States. And in some countries, Facebook is the internet. In the Philippines, Facebook is the internet. In parts of Africa, Facebook is the internet. And the economic opportunity that's created is in the ability to find jobs, the ability to find training and reskilling, meaningful human connection, life-saving health information. Many small and medium-sized businesses run their entire businesses on uh, the Facebook infrastructure, consumer engagement, all of the sales that are done by these businesses and so on, uh, a tremendous amount of economic value being created by social media as well. But right now we're at a crossroads. 
we are clearly at a crossroads between the promise of social media on one hand and the peril that it can endanger uh, on the other. We're at a crossroads between privacy and insecurity, between free speech and hate speech, between truth and falsity, very democracy and authoritarianism and meaningful human connection on one hand and dramatic political polarization on the other. In the book, I describe how social media works under the hood. So there's an entire chapter called Your Brain on Social Media that goes into the neuroscience of how social media works to affect our decisions and our behaviors. It goes into what's known as the uh, social brain hypothesis, which demonstrates substantial evidence that our brains evolved to process social signals. And that's why our neocortex ratio is so large. That's why our brain to body weight ratio is so large. And then we invented a technology that scales human social signals uh, across the tr hundreds of trillions every day. Uh, it's no, no surprise that social media uh, had such meteoric growth because it's like tossing a lit match into a pool of gasoline. This chapter also goes into the dopamine reward cycle, how we get little hits of dopamine every time we get a like or a share on our content. And Sean Parker told the journalist Mike Allen in 2017 that, yeah, that's how we designed Facebook, to give you little hits of dopamine every time you get a like or a share to keep you coming back for more. So how does this really work to influence our behaviors and decisions? How does it affect our kids' brains? I have a seven-year-old son. I'm certainly very curious about how social media and technology is affecting his brain. There's a whole additional chapter on the economics of social media, how uh, network effects drive the social media economy and how a uh, little known paper from 1974 by Jeffrey Rolfs predicted Facebook's go-to-market strategy and how Facebook would ultimately beat MySpace. And that was all about local network effects and how local network effects can create tremendous value from the clustering of social networks online. And there's a lot of uh, coverage of the business implications of social media and how businesses can use social media to gain competitive advantage. I tell the story of Procter & Gamble and Mark Pritchard who did a very bold thing cutting their digital marketing efforts at Procter & Gamble by $200 million and marketing gurus were up in arms. They said, there's no way uh, Procter & Gamble can do this without contracting uh, their sales, but they grew sales by 7.5%, nearly doubling uh, their industry average during this time. And in the book, uh, I describe how they did it. In an earnings call, the chief financial officer said, our total reach and frequency were probably up in the quarter, total marketing spend required to achieve that reach and frequency and deliver that growth and market share gains was down. And the way that they did this was by solving Wanamaker's paradox. So you may recall that Wanamaker said uh, his marketing paradox was, well, I know that half my ad budget is wasted. I just don't know which half. But social media analytics and digital marketing analytics allow you to know which half, which allows you to be smarter and more optimized around how you use social media as a business. And the way that P&G did it is that they shifted their focus from frequency to reach. So not hitting people 20 different times with advertising, but reaching new customers. Targeting, 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 which is much more uh, accomplishable in the social media era for good and for evil in the sense that targeting can be done of misinformation and targeting can be done to get people vaccinated or to get, encourage people to take HIV tests, all of which are covered in the book. Uh, and so the way that PNG did it is just one of the examples that I describe uh, in the book. The book goes under the hood of the algorithms that run social media in what I describe as a hype loop between machine intelligence on one hand and human behavior on the other. As the machine analyzes our behavior to optimize its nudges and suggestions, and we either take or leave those suggestions to create a dynamic loop of machine and human behavior interacting to drive the outcomes that we see in society. 
The book provides a framework for how we can adapt to social media and achieve its promise and avoid its peril. And we really have four levers at our disposal, which I call money, code, norms, and laws. Money is the business models of the social media platforms, which guide the uh, behavior of the advertisers and the behaviors of the users of those platforms. Right now, it's based on an attention economy, which is driven by engagement. What does that mean for how we behave on social media and in the offline world? Code is the design of the platforms and the algorithms that underlie the platforms. I really get under the hood of how it all works in the book. Norms are how we choose to use the technology and laws are obviously regulation. Uh, today, we have hearings in the United States where Sundar Pichai, Mark Zuckerberg, and Jack Dorsey are all going to be grilled by Congress uh, around their spreading of misinformation, as well as whether Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act should be repealed or reformed. All of these regulatory questions are looming large. One of the main questions, for instance, is how do we maintain competition in the social economy? Many people think breaking up Facebook or breaking up the market leaders would work. I take a very specific position on that in the book and say that we need much more uh, structural reform of the social media economy itself. As a managerial economist, my belief is that we need things like interoperability legislation and social network and data portability that will ensure sustainable competition in the long run. Because the social economy runs on network effects, if you break up the market leader, it will just tip the next Facebook-like company into market dominance. We need more structural reforms. I talk about privacy legislation, how we can learn from both the benefits and the, the pros and the cons of the GDPR in Europe to try and understand how the United States, for instance, might develop its own federal privacy legislation, how we now have three regimes of privacy in the United States. China is essentially a surveillance state, Europe under the GDPR very heavily privacy centric, and the United States trying to figure out how it should decide which way to go next. We've written a lot. Uh, for instance, this article we published in Science about how we protect our elections from social media manipulation. We've seen that in 2016 in the US. We've seen that in the Brexit vote uh, in the UK. We've seen it in 2020 in the US again. Uh, we have very specific thoughts based on research on how we deal. The final thing I'd like to say is that we have to get past this debate about whether social media is good or evil? The answer is yes. We need to focus on how, what are the concrete things that we can do to achieve the promise of social media while avoiding the peril. And that's why I wrote this book, to describe how we must adapt and how we can do that. So thank you very much. And I look forward to your questions. Brilliant, thank you so much uh, for the uh, presentation. Uh, as you can imagine, we've already been generating uh, a few uh, questions that have been fed through uh, to me. Some of them are quite similar, but let me kind of do them in the order that I've uh, received them. So the first one is uh, from Nancy from Portland. How do we manage these algorithms that she says have bubbleized information and separating humanity into social and I think is se separating humanity into socially distant histionic uh, groups? Um, such a great, such a great question. I spent an entire chapter on this question in the book, uh, which is called uh, The Wisdom and the Madness of Crowds. And we've done a, a, a very large experiments at MIT that look at how algorithms that are based on engagement and intention can create polarization and what we need to do to, uh, to avoid that. And you'd be surprised to learn how this began in the first place. Facebook has also done its own research that demonstrates this. And what happens in human social networks is that birds of a feather tend to flock together, that we tend to make friendships with people who are like ourselves. But this is accelerated in social media by what are known as PYMK or people you may know algorithms, friend suggestion algorithms. So the way that this works is these algorithms suggest to you who you should connect to next in the network. Now, this is a very difficult engineering challenge because if I'm trying to suggest something, uh, someone to Edgar 
who he should connect to next in the network, I would need to search through the billions of people on social media to choose who to recommend to him. Well, an easy engineering shortcut that engineers at these companies discovered early on was that if I limit the, the number of um, others that I search through to make a recommendation to friends of friends, somebody who is two hops away from you in the network, I will increase the uptake in those recommendations and I will massively simplify the engineering challenge of having the algorithms run through all of that data. But the unintended consequence of that is that these algorithms, as is described to me by engineers at these companies, quote, go around closing triangles in the human social network, making people who have mutual friends connect to each other. This increases the amount of homophily and clustering in the, in the human social network and reduces the amount of other types of opinions that we see and the amount of diversity that we see. In order to solve these types of problems, we need to have algorithms that have, have multiple objective functions, not just maximizing connections and engagement, but things like maximizing diversity, uh, we need to have algorithmic transparency where we understand what the algorithms are doing combined with algorithmic choice. So imagine you have a suite of possible friend suggestion or newsfeed algorithms that you can choose from as a user. You can turn the dials. I would like more diversity. I would like to see more from this perspective or that perspective. Jack Dorsey has actually endorsed that approach where users would have a choice over which algorithms run their newsfeed on Twitter. That type of transparency, that type of choice combined with multiple objective functions in the algorithms and an understanding of how they work under the hood so that we can deal with some of their unintended consequences is what we need. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, I think this ties in very neatly to uh, a question from Peter, one of our current uh, students, actually one of our current students I'm teaching uh, this year. Coming back to the point that you made uh, about uh, interoperability as one of the ways of, of, of addressing these kinds of concerns. And he says, rather than focusing on the technical details of the interoperability of the multiple algorithms that you were proposing, are you worried that Facebook will simply try to lobby against these kinds of solutions. So it's great if Jack Dorsey says, this is something we're interested in doing, but if the shareholders say, actually, we would prefer it to be done in this kinds of way, or we aren't convinced of these ideas coming from MIT or wherever, to what extent do you think that's a risk? And to what extent do you think you can react to those kinds of concerns? Well, certainly, uh, I think that um, the market, any market leader in, a, in an economy driven by network effects will oppose interoperability. And the reason for that is because it uh, will eat away at their market share. So in the United States, when we had the AOL Time Warner merger, the AIM Instant Messenger, AOL's Instant Messenger was the market leader in instant messaging. It had 65% market share. As a condition of the AOL Time Warner merger, AIM was forced to become interoperable with Yahoo Messenger and MSN Messenger. The very next year, AIM's market share dropped from 65% to 59%. A year after that, it dropped to 55%. And three years later, it seeded the entire market to new entrants. That demonstrates how interoperability can create competition. So I very much believe that Facebook and others will try to oppose interoperability legislation because it makes it harder for them to harness network effects to appropriate all of the value from the social economy. But I think we have to resist that lobbying. In the United States, we certainly have uh, issues around the amount of corporate money uh, and lobbying uh, in legislation and legislative processes. That's a separate issue that I touch on in the book as well. But I think we have to stay strong and we have to make sure that we approach uh, regulation uh, in a way that is designed to increase consumer surplus. And the best way to do that is to create competition. The best way to do that is with things like interoperability and social network and data portability. And the fact that they will resist 
is an excellent sign that we're on the right path. Yeah, uh, and, and uh, th that kind of immediately brings to mind uh, the UK's experience around open banking, which was all about opening up uh, APIs to non-bank competitors precisely because the Competition and Markets Authority in the UK was concerned about the level of competition in the banking uh, sector. And the UK's open banking experience around API access to data is, is, a, is a very similar kind of uh, reaction. I just had a question that's just scrolled off as the next question came up, one second. Uh, this is a question from Kelvin Price. Uh, very, very briefly, just a nice simple question. Can you explain the relationship between hype and misinformation? Ooh, so <laughs> yes, we did a study with Twitter that was published on the cover of Science in March, 2018, where we studied all of the verified true and false news stories that ever spread on Twitter from 2006 to 2017, 10 years of data. And what we found was that false news traveled farther, faster, deeper, and more broadly than the truth in every category of information, sometimes by an order of magnitude, and that political false news was the most viral. When we looked into why, our first idea was, well, maybe false news spreaders have more followers, or maybe they follow more people, or more active, or maybe they have, or more often verified users of Twitter, or maybe they've been on Twitter longer. So we checked each one of these in turn, and in every case, the opposite was true. False news spreaders had fewer followers, followed fewer people, were less often verified, had been on Twitter for less time and so on. So we had to seek an alternative explanation. What we looked at was what we called the novelty hypothesis. And it turns out that false news is more novel, more shocking, more surprising, anger inducing and blood boiling. So it's engaging, it hypes us up. And that's why I call this the hype machine, because it's based, the business model of the social media economy is based on an engagement model where they engage users and then they sell users attention to advertisers as a precursor to persuasion or as an opportunity to persuasion through ads. And so hyping us up, engaging us, runs the business model and false news is more engaging because it's novel, shocking, surprising, anger inducing and blood boiling. And that's the connection between hype and falsity. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, a question from Carlos Carrasco, who is based at Esade Business School in Barcelona. There is significant evidence from some of your colleagues at MIT, for example, David Rand, that some behavioral interventions may reduce the spread of misinformation on, in social networks. However, social, social networks face a trade-off reducing the spread of misinformation while losing engagement or not doing so. How do you think we could implement nudging interventions that are effective, but also acceptable from the business model point of view of these social networks? Well, I'm so proud to say uh, that Dave Rand and his team published a paper in Nature this week that uh, uh, puts out some of those exact results that you're talking about. I've known about this paper uh, for a while now, obviously. Uh, so Dave Rand runs the misinformation pillar of the uh, initiative on the digital economy, which I direct. And we're so proud of uh, him and his team for the research that he's been doing on solutions. What this paper shows is that a system that I've been describing since my TED talk in 2018 could really work. And the way it would work is that it would combine crowdsourcing, labeling, and machine learning together to scale a solution to misinformation. And the way it would work is this, and you see elements of this already starting to crop up. So what Dave Rand and his team have shown is that when you nudge people to be reflective about the information they're consuming, they're less likely to believe and less likely to share misinformation. One intervention that they've shown works experimentally is to ask people to think about the accuracy of the information that they are consuming uh, periodically. And the thing that this does is it puts people into a reflective mode. And so they're less likely to believe and share any misinformation that comes immediately after the nudge or for some time after the nudge. But what it also does is it crowdsources labels of accuracy from the crowd. Imagine if you did this on, at scale 
asking people about accuracy. You would collect hundreds of millions to trillions of labels about what's accurate and what's not accurate. But the thing about misinformation and labeling, which is something I advocated back in 2018, is that we need more labels. So if you think about it, when you go to the grocery store to buy food to consume, it's extensively labeled. You know how many calories it has, how many trans fats. We don't have the same labels about the information that we consume, but we need them. This is a way to scale that uh, by crowdsourcing the labels. But when you think about misinformation, research also shows that as soon as you start labeling it, people assume that the stories that you don't label are true. That's known as the implied truth effect, which means any labeling strategy must scale to any almost all information very rapidly. So the way you do that is by combining labeling and crowdsourcing the labels, which also give you a nudge toward reflectivity that lower your likelihood of believing and sharing information. You combine all that with machine learning. So you feed those labels into machine learning models that can then learn how to uh, predict and detect falsity and then create those labels to create a cycle of reflection and labeling, reflection and labeling that will give us the provenance of the information that we're consuming so that we can make smarter choices about it. Research is showing that this system could really work. Great, thanks. Uh, another question from a current MSc student, again, another student I'm teaching at the moment from Georgia Meyer. Do you envisage that a solution will arise from the current dominant platforms being significantly reevaluated, perhaps through the mixture of levers that you identify? Or do you envisage a possibility or even a necessity that it will actually be a new platform that will make those kinds of, of changes? We need both. So we need competition and we need space for new entrants and innovation. Uh, we need consumers to have choice so they're not locked in to a given platform. The way that network effects work, think about it this way. Whether you like Facebook or not, you can't leave because all your friends are there. But if you could connect with those friends from a new platform very easily, you might make the choice to leave or more people might make the choice to leave. The way that the platforms maintain control today is by putting up walled gardens that only enable you to access your meaningful human connections through the platforms that came first, the ones that are the largest. If we were to initiate interoperability, social network and data portability, research shows that this would create competition, innovation and space for new entrants. But we also need the current platforms to have technical and behavioral solutions to misinformation. We also need them to have comprehensive and uh, transparent policies on content moderation. And we simultaneously need room for new entrants so that new platforms can come with solutions that might draw the, uh, the uh, interests of consumers if they were unable to make the choice to leave the current platforms to go to a new one, that might give incentives to the current platforms to actually change, which is something they don't have right now. There's no incentive for these platforms to change because they are making money hand over fist without any competition uh, challenging them uh, to be better in order to keep their users. And of course, contributing 390 billion surplus to the US economy, which also makes regulators perhaps a little hesitant at stepping in too much to, to not kill off the, the golden goose on, on that particular thing. Uh, question from my colleague, uh, Professor Susan Scott from LSE. Uh, social media makes many frontline workers vulnerable to direct personal comment by members of the public. This changes the dynamics of accountability. What should organizations do to manage this better? Uh, let me see if I understand the question. So the, the idea is that uh, organizations are more um, exposed to opinions from the crowd as well as to direct conversations. Yeah, uh, and, from... and, and particularly the individual workers. So if I'm working for LSE, I might get the social media comments directly to me. How might LSE, as it were, protect me? Uh, or should LSE be protecting me uh, if I'm just being getting the comments on, as a result of my uh, role or responsibility? Well, Susan, it's so great to hear from you, uh, even if virtually. Uh, and thank you for the question. 
Certainly, this raises a number of challenges, both at the organizational level in terms of ethics and how they deal uh, with privacy and uh, data around employees, but also how they deal with the movement from uh, uh, into, I should say, a real-time conversation with millions of voices um, in this conversation simultaneously. So I think that uh, two, two things come to mind. First is that organizations need to develop um, processes for what I call social listening, for understanding what is happening in this real-time conversation that mentions them or that relates to them in one way or the other. We see that uh, conversations that happen on social media can have dramatic uh, implications for the reputation of organizations. A story I tell in the book is after the 2016 election, then CEO of Pepsi, Indra Nui, uh, made comments to the New York Times that said she was disappointed with the election result. She congratulated Trump and called for unity, but this turned into a meme, which essentially uh, uh, created the greatest drop in Pepsi's reputation uh, the, for the entire year, greater than three quarters of bad financial results, which shows you how <laughs> dramatic this real-time conversation can be. But at the same time, there's a tremendous amount of uh, difficulty in understanding where the boundary is of responsibility for an organization's reputation. If I'm an employee uh, and, and, uh, and my Twitter handle mentions that I'm part of this and I start getting... Um, you know, questions online. I think that the that organizations need to develop uh, policies that guide their employees for how to uh, deal with conversations online, systematic policies for social listening to understand the conversations that are happening online that mention them, and as well to have people who are responsible for uh, addressing those conversations directly on behalf of the organization. At the same time, they have to develop ethical standards around privacy and, uh, and how they can or cannot um, you know, uh, monitor their employees' use of social media, whether something somebody says uh, in their free time uh, should be subject to organizational oversight uh, if they're saying it as an individual. The, this all arises because of the blurring of the boundaries between organizational and, uh, and individual conversations that have melded together in the social media conversation online. So it's a difficult challenge. Yeah. Uh, a question from Ruth Sang, uh, an LSE anthropology alumnus. Uh, despite raising awareness around the perils of fake news on social media, do you think that social media also contributes to the distrust towards experts? Um, I think a lot of things contribute to the distrust towards experts. I think that we have seen, um, you know, political leaders take aim at expertise as no longer being relevant. Uh, that is combined with uh, social media conversations that happen. So I, as I describe in the book, I don't think that social media is uniquely responsible for any outcome. I think it lives in a societal zeitgeist and accelerates, catalyzes, and enables certain, um, you know, uh, uh, societal uh, trends that we're seeing, but it isn't the sole cause of those trends. Uh, I think that we have seen an erosion of confidence and expertise. I think that is uh, particularly pro problematic in places where we need expertise the most. The first thing that comes to my mind there is, for instance, climate change, a need to listen to the growing near uh, unanimity of expert opinion about climate change and the role of human beings in accelerating climate change being denied in, in ways by people who are uh, anti-expertise. I think that can have dramatically negative consequences for our uh, global society. Um, and I do think that we need to think more about how to uh, maintain the reputation of experts online. What we're seeing now in the United States is an acute situation around vaccines and vaccine hesitancy, where the experts are trying to encourage people to take vaccines and there is an anti-vax movement uh, which decries the expertise and as well 
uh, sort of makes false claims about the harmful effects of vaccines. And that can have very meaningful effects on the life and death of individual citizens, as well as the public health trajectory of the pandemic, which will have knock on effects for the recovery of the economy, employment, uh, whether people have food to eat uh, and, and you know, wages uh, that will allow them to put food on the table and so on. So I think this is a, a critical issue and we need to pay attention to it. Great. A uh, question from Tanya Olivier, who is, so again, one of my students, but this time an undergraduate, second year undergraduate student. Uh, you mentioned the effect of the diffusion of fake news through social media. However, as a Generation Z student, many news that are of interest to me, climate change, BLM, gender issues, are not widely published and widely covered in the mainstream media. Therefore, how can I stop using or perhaps restrict using my social media as my main sources of information? when the mainstream media deliberately ignores certain news? Yeah. Isn't democracy more generally threatened by the biasness of the media channels than just by social media? No, I think it's a, it's a fantastic point. And nowhere in the book do I claim that we need to abandon social media. In fact, quite the opposite. I see social media as a democratizing force if done right. I see social media as a force for good if done right. I see social media as creating a tremendous amount of consumer surplus if done right. I see social media as a tool to encourage vaccinations, HIV tests, et cetera, uh, if done right. The, the, the thing about social media is that given the fact that we're at this crossroads between the promise and the peril, how we turn those four knobs or levers, the money, the code, the norms, and the laws are going to determine whether it's done right or not. And we have a window of opportunity now, I believe, of about 24 months where we really need to have the rubber meet the road in terms of regulation, in terms of policies of the platforms themselves, in terms of how users use uh, the, the, the media, as well as, um, as well as the economic business models. I certainly don't believe that the mainstream media uh, is devoid of its problems. There in the United States, we have a very polarized uh, cable news media, which caters to the right on one hand or the left on the other. They talk past each other, they exaggerate. Um, and, and that is certainly part of the problem. Uh, but what I think what we need is to uh, make sure that we adapt social media to achieve the promise and avoid the peril. At the same time, when you read the neuroscience chapter, uh, I give recommendations for how we can manage some of the neuroscience effects that social media has on us. So for instance, when you have the dopamine reward cycle that the social media platforms are built around, in addition to what's known as the variable reinforcement schedule of that dopamine reward cycle, which means that the notifications of a like or a comment or a share, which makes our phones buzz or light up, can come at any time. And therefore our minds and our attention is always on our phone. Is it gonna buzz now? It, you know, is, is the next buzz gonna come in the next second? So I'm always thinking about checking my phone. But one way to, to, dis, uh, to sort of short circuit that is to schedule your social media use, give yourself as much time as you think you need, but have it be a block of the day where you use it. And then when you're not using it, turn notifications off so that you know not to think about or worry about whether you're gonna get a notification and you're gonna see all those notifications when you see the next block of social media time. That short circuits the variable reinforcement schedule and the dopamine reward cycle that they've built in and allows us to control social media rather than social media controlling us. So the focus mode, particularly as students start preparing for their exams is, is really, really helpful. Uh, a, 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 a question that kind of ties into that. So you've talked about the 24 months window of opportunity that you see. And, and so this is a question from Harold Aaron, uh, pointing out that in the book, you understandably particularly focus on the classic social media that were, was particularly dominant as you were doing the, the writing of that. And he asks, uh, how would you, he asked, how do you assess, but I'm kind of more broadly, do, do the frameworks still apply on things like TikTok or audio platforms like Clubhouse, when it, particularly when it comes to misinformation or what kinds of adjustments are you having to make for those new forms of technology? 
Great question. So I wrote the book in order to uh, sort of espouse and discuss lasting frameworks that are applicable to social media, regardless of the specific technology. I do discuss TikTok in the book. Uh, Clubhouse launched very recently as an audio platform is a new instantiation, but the frameworks are the same because the frameworks are flexible to deal with any technology that has the underlying elements of social media, which are three. So in the book, I describe the technology trifecta that creates the social economy, which are the digital social networks that connect us many to many online, the hype loop algorithms that is the dynamic interplay of machine intelligence and human behavior, and then what I call the input output device, which is currently the smartphone, but as I predict in the book, in the future could be AR or VR or audio. Each of those pieces of the trifecta could evolve, but the elements of the trifecta and their nature are the same. And so the frameworks in the book apply to social media as it evolves going forward. You're hopeful that the predictions and the framework will, 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 will cope with those. And I think I think you're actually uh, right. Uh, a question, question from Andrew Lone, coming back to some of the more underlying theories. From your evidence, what motivates people to accept false information that they see as true? Or do they just not care whether it's true or false if it confirms their existing biases? So is this, hey, this is something that confirms what we are doing? Or is it actually that kind of almost Shannon-like information theory of the novelty uh, yeah. That's the process. So three things. First, it's the Shannon-like information novelty. In fact, we use Claude Shannon's formulation of novelty to measure the novelty of true and false information online in our Twitter study and showed that the Shannon measured uh, novelty, three different measures of novelty, are actually related to the spread of falsity compared to the spread of the truth. That's one. So the shock, surprise, and novelty of it. And if you think about the theory behind that, it makes sense. If you read the cognitive science literature, you know human attention is drawn to novelty. And if you read the sociology literature, you know that we gain in status when we share novel information because we're seen as being in the know or having access to inside information that other people don't know. We seem to be a valuable source of information if we're uh, putting out um, novel things that other people can't find elsewhere. So from the sociology and cognitive science theories, novelty is um, uh, provides for the spread of falsity in that way. So that's one. Uh, the second is confirmation bias in the sense that the more it confirms, it's surprising, but it fits into our worldview, the more likely uh, we are to believe and share it. But the third thing that I think has been surprising to a lot of people is that people don't want to share false news. This is the work of David Rand that we were talking about earlier. When people are reflective and think critically, they actually realize when they realize that it's fake or they, they consider the accuracy of it being important, they share it less and they believe it less. The reason people share it is sort of a knee-jerk uh, system one in Danny Kahneman's uh, terms thinking style of thinking rather than a system two reflective and critical style of thinking. If you can, and that's why the experiments show that if you can nudge people to be more critical and reflective, they actually don't share or believe the information. So if it were the case that it was just that they wanna share it or that they are inspired to share it, then when they point out that it's false, they wouldn't share it any less but they do share it less, which means it's more of a knee-jerk reaction, which is a good thing for us because it means that there are solutions that are readily available to this problem. Right, a uh, question from an unnamed PhD student from Queensland University of Tech Technology in Brisbane, Australia. We observe that technologies are accelerating at a rapid rate. Do you think the tech companies are applying or have begun to apply the controls that you mentioned, for example, interoperability at a similar rate? Or uh, because the main message, even the so in the social dilemma, is we have to act now before it is too late. So, are they? Is your sense that they are moving quickly enough, or do they, they need a bit of a kick up the to to move faster? They are moving, but I don't think that they're moving quickly enough. 
So what we've seen is more movements to label misinformation clearly across all the platforms, deplatforming uh, conspiracy uh, uh, clusters like QAnon in the United States, for example, uh, happening on Facebook. Uh, I spoke uh, with Nick Clegg, who is uh, global head of PR for um, uh, Facebook, and you know, it's clear that they are making moves towards trying to deal with some of these solutions. I think the threat of regulation is also inspiring them to be more proactive about some of these interoperability. So there is a consortium of uh, that Twitter and Facebook, Microsoft and others are part of that want to make social media and the internet economy more interoperable, but uh, it's not moving uh, very quickly. I think that there are two uh, levers that need to work hand in hand here. You need the pressure of regulation to have self-regulation move quickly enough. And the added pressure of the specter of regulation will make the platforms move more quickly. So we need to keep the pressure up in terms of regulation. We need to monitor and encourage self-regulation uh, and we need both in fact, we need all four of these oars, which I described the four levers, rowing together and in the same direction for us to have a chance to uh, really adapt quickly enough to the impacts that social media is having on our society. Right. So, I think, so I've got a question from Jeremy Jostock, which I think you, another one of our current MSC students that I think you've kind of answered, which is, do you think anyone is still in control of social media? I think there's no one person in control but there clearly are, it's also not completely autonomous. There are people worrying about it, whether it's former Lib Dem MPs or the tech companies or the regulators that are all contributing to that. We're running very short on time. So I think we've got one last uh, question from Amrita Ramya, an LSE MSc student. Out of the three predictions of disruptions, which according to you is the biggest risk to humanity and which can be most easily brought into line? Just a nice, easy one to finish. Yeah, with. yeah. Uh, I, I'm, I'm most worried about uh, the impacts on democracy. Um, I think that certainly the most acute right now is the public health risk because of the pandemic. Uh, I think that, you know, global health pandemics like the one that we see today are black swan events that happen once every hundred years. The more insidious uh, problem I think is the problem around democracy because I think it has to do with a deterioration of trust in democratic institutions, uh, elections, the fear that foreign actors are intervening in the Brexit vote or the US election can really erode trust in our institutions, in our democracy, which can have a corrosive effect on our civil society. I think that that is probably my biggest fear. Uh, when I started making predictions about impacts on democracy in the book, people said, oh, you're going way overboard. <laughs> Why are you being so hyperbolic? And then we had a foiled plot to kidnap and kill the governor of Michigan in the United States. We had a Capitol riot. We had all sorts of problems that were predicted in the book. Nobody tells me that I was hyperbolic anymore and I'm very disappointed. I wish I had been wrong. Uh, my prediction today is that the, the corrosive effects on democracy and civil society and the institutions, the trust in the institutions is, is critical. And potentially also seeps out onto also your trust in public health and public health health Absolutely. Uh, as well. So it starts with democracy, but, but feeds out into all of these others. Thank you so, so much. It's been absolute pleasure for us and the whole audience to hear you speak, Sinan. It's been absolutely uh, brilliant. Uh, thank you so much for taking part. Let's hope that the next time you come to speak to our LSE audience uh, is uh, in person. Love to have you back uh, at LSE so you can see all of the new buildings that we have uh, been putting up. Just a reminder, as you can see, that the um, events uh, that Sinan's been talking about, his book, The Hype Machine, details of which are found on the uh, event uh, listing, or you can also find details about Sinan in his uh, personal webpage. Thank you all very much for joining us and wishing you a happy afternoon.